Thank you for the prayer. You know, uh, concerning the subject we're going to talk about this morning, uh, is the context real or a metaphor? What is it? Is it context real or is it a metaphor? Because uh, many in the world, they switch the definitions of what is real or what is the metaphor. Even in the Church of Christ, they switch the definition of what is a real or what is a metaphor. And you can't switch those two around because you're going to teach some dangerous doctrine, not just to yourself, but also those who you talk to are going to be deceived and tricked into believing another gospel. So in John chapter 6, if we look at verse 51, Jesus said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, if we look at this verse, and he uses the word bread, if you look at the Greek definition of this word, it means actual bread. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say figuratively. Uh, he uses that word, and in the Greek, it means real bread. So if we were to take the real definition in Greek, then we would define this verse as Jesus, a loaf of bread, <laughs> if we do that. So that's misapplying the definition because the context around this chapter is going to tell us exactly what he's talking about. And so this is just one example, but there's other examples where <laughs> definitions are misapplied. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat man and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. This is a building he's teaching. This is an outside. This is an, a public location where everybody's listening. In verse number 16, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? This is a hard saying, who can hear it? This is the same thing that many saints are saying today. This is a hard saying. Let's redefine it. This is a hard saying. Let's just read over it. For those that did an excellent job on the resurrection uh, this morning, they say that as well. This is a hard saying. Let's reinvent what it means. Let's say that the resurrection is uh, in 70 AD when Christ came. The resurrection is spiritual and not souls coming from paradise. They're redefining what it means. Verse 61 says, When Jesus knew in himself, his disciples murmured at it. He said to them, Did this offend you? This is powerful. Did this make you, is this causing you to, to trip up? Is this offending you? Is this causing you an offense? The truth. And that's the question we should ask today. Is the truth offending you? Do you hate us because we tell you the truth? Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And so the point of offense comes when I don't understand you. If I don't understand you, then I don't want to know you. I don't want to walk with you anymore. Uh, so if I don't know you and you confuse me, then, then I'm going to speak against you. right? But the problem is in Christ. The problem is them. Not seeking to understand what he's talking about. Uh, he says in verse number 62, What? And if he shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. There is a spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's the answer we're supposed to grasp. That's the answer that's supposed to understand concerning the bread, the flesh, the blood. He says, verse 64, But there are some of you that believe not. For well, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Now, many of those who believe not are leaders. You know, they desire to lead like Korah. 
have them in the church, leaders, have that desire to lead. But the problem is that they're leading into destruction of the men in the body of Christ. So verse 65, he said, Therefore I said to you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. From that time, many of his disciples, it says many, not a few, many went back and walked no more uh, with him. Just from this one subject, walk no more with him. Just from this one subject. And he gave them the answer. But they strove among themselves and talked among themselves, lean on their own understanding. And they, they did not seek Christ afterward. If we look at, if we look at uh, another scripture concerning the definition of words, look at Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Looking at verse 1. This is the Old Testament. Uh, the scripture says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tables that he may run that readeth it. Right? For the vision is yet for an, an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Now, if you look at verse 3, you'll think verse 3 is contradicting its own self. He says, uh, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. He says, it, it will tarry. And then the last four words are, it will not tarry. But the answer is in between the two. Wait for it. Wait for it. It has an appointed time of when it's going to come. And so, concerning this scripture, they twist the definitions of another subject, even the coming of Christ. If you look at uh, James chapter 5 or 7, James 5, 7 in the New Testament, uh, where James says in verse 7, Be patient, therefore. That means to wait. Brethren, until the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth mm -hmm. and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. So that's what he's telling us to do. That's the gospel is to wait on the Lord. Verse 8 says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now that's the message for those on earth in the church. That's the message for those in paradise. Wait on the Lord. That's the message that goes from when you die in the paradise, they're still, still, they're still saying to wait. We have to wait on the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's not for a time frame of 70 AD as some of these men desire to say. That's when the resurrection happened in the church. These, these men are mostly from the north side of America, northern area. And so when they see the word for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, they don't consider the other scriptures that Peter spoke on concerning how God sees time. One day is to the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And so the gospel's message is to always be ready and be patient for his coming. It's coming near. And they don't see it from Christ's standpoint. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. I want to read a specific thought here. Because these two scriptures don't contradict each other. Look, it says, uh, look at verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 2 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ is at hand. So he's saying, don't be troubled or shaken by in spirit, mind, or troubled by word, by letter, that the, the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, in verse number two, he says that 
Don't be soon shaken that the day of the Christ is at hand. Now, does this contradict James chapter 5, verse 8, where it says the coming of the Lord draw nigh? No, it doesn't. Amen. It doesn't. So the idea is that the lesson that Christ told them is to always be ready because I'm coming soon. From his viewpoint, I'm coming quick. Always be ready. He's going to come. The word quickly means surprise. He's going to be a surprise when he comes. And not just to mention, you have to look at the mind of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 2 says the, concerning the mind of Christ. If we read that verse to get a, a viewpoint of how we should think. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, he says, verse 14, Second Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man received not the, the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who had known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ to tell the difference between the context of what is real, what is a metaphor, and what the scriptures are talking about. Uh, if we look continually, Hebrews 10, verse 37. Hebrews 10, 37. Let's look at another view here. The scripture says in verse 37, For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. You cannot set an appointed time of when Christ will return. Amen. Amen. Just because it said a little while, just because it says will not tarry, doesn't mean you have the authority to set a time frame. And this is a mistake that the Jehovah's Witnesses have made. Mm -hmm. They said Jesus was going to come in a certain time and he didn't come. Mm -hmm. But our brethren are doing the opposite. They're saying that this, the certain time that he came, came already in 70 AD. Wow. But the idea is that some of them say he came and he was seen. Others say that he came spiritually and he, you see him in your, in your mind as a completion of the church. So there's two dividing doctrines in that false teaching that they have. And so it happens when they lean on their own understanding. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 22 of the Old Testament. Ezekiel. Because there's some things in the Bible we have to recognize. There's some things in the Bible that did happen quick. I mean, instantly. Something when Peter said, let's build a church for Elijah, for Moses and for you. That happened when God came down in a voice, in a cloud. When he spoke from the cloud, that happened instantly. Now, that definition of quickly compared to how God defines it from his time frame viewpoint is two different things. And so we can't always add the word quickly as the exact same thing as being instant of other scriptures in the Bible because you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself and add to God's word. Um, let's see Ezekiel. Look at uh, chapter 12 in the Old Testament. And this is dangerous science. It's, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing to be blinded by your own self and allow others uh, to blind you. That's why we have to ask questions. That's why it's, it's a blessing to be here, to uh, be among brethren that have the patience to sit with one another and to share scriptures in order to come on one mind and to be on the same accord. So Ezekiel 20, uh, 12, verse 22, it says, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel? Saying the days are prolonged and every vision faileth. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision, for well, there shall be no more any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, said the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel 
say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesied of the times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. So here we have uh, where God is setting a time frame now. He says, uh, I will, he says, for in your days, Lord Brothers House, will I say the word and will perform it. And that's what he's letting them know. It's not going to be prolonged now. Mm -hmm. This, what I'm going to execute, is going to be in your days. Now, concerning this and concerning other examples of the scriptures, there are times where God is set and there's prophecy spoken that's going to happen in a certain time. And you can't add to that or subtract from that. And to say the exact time frame, because then we become called prophets. That's right. uh, looking at another scripture, Daniel chapter 8. Let's go to down chapter 8. Down chapter 8. Uh, and we're going to look at a few details here. So look at time frame. Look at verse number, uh, I think 19 here. Yeah. Yeah, 19. It says, uh, Daniel 8, 19, And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. Now, one may see this, and they just define what end is. They define what, what the definition of end is. In verse number 20, it says, the ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereof, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. In the latter time of the, their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty, the holy people. And through his policy, also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken without hand. The vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be, he says, for many days. Mm. And I, Daniel, fainted, and was six certain days afterward. I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now, some may say that even this, what is written concerning media, Persia, Grecia, we look at also uh, Rome as well, and when it says in verse 19, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. And some mention that as the end of the world. Mm -hmm. they, and then they define it as Jewish world. Mm -hmm. And then they define it as 70 AD when the, when the destruction of Jerusalem came. Mm -hmm. And so they mention, because we know and understand that that happened at that time frame. But Jesus didn't come at that time frame, 70 AD. Mm -hmm. We understand that the, the temple was destroyed. But the idea is that that's not the end. Of the world. The world is not defined as Jerusalem. And so this end, they define it as, um, that's how they define it concerning the destruction of Jerusalem. But the idea is that this end is not talking about world in the sense of how the scriptures define with flaming fire. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Yeah. And so we have to put it in its proper context and they believe that the earth will continue to exist forever and ever, and death will just rule forever and ever nonstop. But that's a false definition. Uh, down 1014 uh, also mentions another viewpoint here. He says, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall be for thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is uh, for many days. You know, and so we have to look at okay, what is he talking about here? And not only define that as the destruction of the world, but this is for talking about Jews. So recognize what end is God talking about. And in verse number, look at uh, just a comparison, numbers, numbers 16, 
Verse 46, as we mentioned before, concerning quickly, Numbers 16, uh, 46, to look at the two contexts of quick, two contexts of at hand, two contexts of Terry. Number 16, 46, we understand that Korah and his company rose up against Moses and Aaron. They spoke things they shouldn't have spoke. They were swallowed up of the earth. Uh, the next day, another group rose up. And the plague began. They started dropping uh, like flies. In verse number 46, as they were dying, Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire thereon from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. So he says, Go quickly. So verse 47 says, Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran. Into the midst of the congregation. So he didn't walk. He uh, ran. Yeah. So that was instant. This is a definition of instant situation where he ran. Man. He says, and behold, the play was begun among the people. And he put on on instance and made it an atonement for the people. Now, when Christ comes, it's going to be a quick surprise. There's going to be no time for atonement. There's going to be no prayers that you could offer up. His wrath is already boiling. And he's got to prepare. Once he happens, there that's it. Those who are sheep will go forever with his kingdom. Those who are goats will be cast into the lake of fire. And those in hell will be cast into the lake of fire. And that's how it's going to happen. And so mm -hmm. another viewpoint, 2 Peter 3, verse 8, as we read. Just want to read one more time uh, concerning how God sees things. 1 Peter 3, 8. It, the scripture says, I'm, a, I'm sorry, 2 Peter 3 8. 2 Peter 3 8, it says, But beloved, be not ignorant. Don't be ignorant. Don't ignore this, this knowledge, this understanding, this one thing, this one subject. He says, One thing. Don't ignore it, but absorb it. This is the mind of Christ. 2 Corinthians 2 talks about. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Mm -hmm. A thousand years as one day. That's what we have to absorb. And many of our brethren have not absorbed this one thing. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. That's how they count. They count it with hours, minutes, days, months, years. That's how they count slackness. But he's long suffering. To us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 3 says. On this first, that there shall come in the last days. That's in the future they're going to be saying this as well. Walking, uh, scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is this promise of his coming? Or since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So even these scoffers are actually exposing. Look, these scoffers are exposing false doctrine teachers that saying that the, the uh, resurrection and Christ's coming came in 70 AD. Because these scoffers are saying that where is his coming? But these uh, saints of 2020, some of them are saying that it already came mm. in, in 2070 AD. Mm -mm. Both of them in error, but these scoffers are even saying, where is this coming at? Um, somebody has a hand up? Brother Keith. Yeah, I'm going to address that to, uh, to debate. Amen. 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 Yeah. We're going to say that on uh, yeah. I'm gonna say that publicly because... I mean, we got God's word over here showing us yeah. that we can reason uh -huh. through the scriptures. Uh -huh. uh, one gets uh, a couple of points. You went to Daniel. You are talking about the dream. Mm -hmm. And so we understand when the dream that Daniel had came to fruition because those kingdoms came to pass. Mm -hmm. Matthew uh, 22. <clears throat> Matthew 22. I'm sorry, I, I had to turn this thing on and these apps come up when you turn these apps on. Forgive me for that. Matthew 22 and 20 says, and he said unto them, Who's, Who is this uh, an image of superinscription? Now, Jesus is asking his disciples at this time, and they're going to tell him. Then say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. So we realize this is part of the, the revelation that Daniel talked to Nebuchadnezzar about. And that last kingdom that was standing was wrong. Jesus mentions that name. So his kingdom is going to come during the same time as the Caesar's kingdom is going to come. One more thing I wanted to say is that false prophets, we got a misinformation 
war going against our minds. False prophets are bringing this to us. False prophets are, 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 were warned about in Matthew 24. In verse number, Matthew 24, in verse number 3, and Jesus' disciples asked him a question in verse number 3, and it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him proudly, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of the coming of the coming and of the end of the world? And one of the things he mentions right here in verse 11 says, And many false prophets shall, shall rise and shall deceive many. And I just want to drop that in. Amen. 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 And that's the thing. Putting it in the proper context. The real is a metaphor. Is it future or is it past? Because if you misapply that, you're going to hurt yourself. Amen. Look at another scripture. We're going to talk about here now death. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Now, they, they misapply this as well. Uh, I, should, I want to start at verse 23. But every man in his own order, he says, a Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Now, he's talking about the resurrection. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When he shall have put up down all rule, all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Mm. Now, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is still ruling. It's still, it's still reigning. Yeah. They may try to say, change the definition and say, well, that's sin. Oh, sin is, no. sin is, is, is destroyed. Unquote. But this is talking about the existence of people dying. God, see, see, the power of death came through sin. And so God is not going to allow that rule or that power to continue forever and ever and ever. Mm. There's going to be an end to it. Look at verse number 54 of the same chapter. The scripture says, so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Death is swallowed up in victory. See. Death is swallowed up in victory. When we get th that new body that is eternal, immortal, death will be no more. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? Mm -hmm. the, sting of, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Mm. People die because they have sinned. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know? And so... If we look at this same verse, it, it was actually uh, came from uh, Isaiah chapter 25, uh, verse 8. If you look at Isaiah 25, 8 is where it came from. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Isaiah 25, 8. It says in verse 8, uh, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off. From off all the earth, and the Lord has spoken it. Now this mm. is also uh, in Revelations, uh, the chapter twenty-one. Revelation chapter twenty-one. Now, I want to see how this is twisted, or this can be twisted, because in Revelation chapter twenty-one, looking at verse four, Amen. Revelation twenty-one four, the Scripture says, um, "And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes." And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now, my question is, uh, Revelation 21, 4. Now, my question is, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there should be no more death. Now, if we define that as sin, oh. there should be no more sin. Mm -hmm. Then, in the, if the world is going to exist for, if the world is going to exist forever, mm. then there's going to be no more sin. How can that make sense? Because there's still sin going on today. Amen. So if they define that, well, that's talking about sin when it says death. No, that's talking about actual death. Amen. He's going to remove that. It's going to be swallowed up. It's going to be no more. It says, for the former things are passed away. That's what's going to go away. Look at Revelations uh, 20 verse 14 to get another viewpoint. It says, in death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hmm. That's it. Now verse number uh, 12 says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. 
there were just none of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Mm -hmm. So one thing we cannot do, one thing we cannot do is apply where it says death is swallowed up in victory. We cannot apply that as as a false application of saying, well, that means sin. Mm -mm. God is talking about he's going to get rid of death. Mm -hmm. Former things are passed away. We know sin, we know death comes through sin. But the idea is that you can't misapply those two in the context that the scriptures are talking about. Amen. Now, uh, 1 Timothy 1, verse 10. 1 Timothy 1, I mean, sorry, 2 Timothy 1, verse 10. The scripture says, but, I'll start at verse 9. Speaking of Christ, uh, who has saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, Amen. I want to look at this verse good. and compare it with what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 and also in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, to look at the differences and the similarities of here and what the context is talking about. In verse 10, when he says, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and has brought life and immortality. Now, they say Jesus came in 70 AD. Right? <laughs> now, this is dealing with when he came on earth. When it says, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, he abolished death. By dying on the cross, he abolished death because he died for the sins of the world. In other words, spiritual death is what he abolished. And it says, brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Through the gospel, we can live immortally That's right. forever. Our souls can. But our bodies are going to have to die. Yes. So the context of this definition in verse 10 is that he got rid of death eternally. That's right. Because if you obey the gospel, Christ seals you. As you are my immortal son or daughter. And if he sees his walk faithfully. Then we can live immortally. So that's the context in verse number 10. That's the context. And so if you don't write and divide this with the other verses. And look at the right context. You're going to get confused and mixed up. Right? Amen. And so. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to ask you a question. 80, 70 is the day you were talking about. This, this happened right now. They said that Christ came in 70 AD. Oh, 70 AD, 70 mm -hmm. AD. And the church resurrected in 70 AD. It matured from Judaism. It resurrected spiritually from Judaism, is what they teach. Yeah. I didn't see Christ. I didn't see it. I believe you. I didn't see it. Amen. Still waiting. Man. And so every eye, it says in Revelation 1-7, mm -hmm. shall see him. Now, if we look at another viewpoint here, look at uh, a few scriptures. <laughs> look at Ephesians 3.21. Ephesians 3.21, just to get a, a viewpoint here. The scripture says in that particular verse, uh, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, in this verse, they use, okay, the world is going to be forever and ever. Mm, it says, mm. world without end. Amen. And so they twist the context of what the writer is talking about, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit talks, how Jesus talks, and what he's referencing in this particular verse. And I want to look at a few scriptures to understand this subject and how it can be twisted. Uh, look at Exodus chapter 21, verse 5. Ex Exodus chapter 21, verse 5, to look at how the Holy Spirit writes. I want to start at verse 2, actually. Exodus, Exodus 21, verse 2. It says, if thou, if you buy, if thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh, he shall go out free for nothing. Now, uh, this is slavery. They had, this is a law that God gave if you were 
by a Hebrew slave. Verse 3, if, if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall go, um, shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall do what bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now, if we take that little that he shall serve him forever. That means that this Hebrew servant, slave, is still alive. No. Nope. He's still alive. If you take that, but if you define it, if you define forever mm -hmm. as in the context of continuance, mm -hmm. he'll continually serve you yes. mm -hmm. as it's supposed to be defined because that's how it's defined in Hebrew. Then that's the accurate definition because we know he's not alive anymore. Now, the same scenario can happen. And, and did happen actually if we look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Because sometimes you do have to look at the context of the scriptures. Context means the words that are before and around it. Sometimes you have to look at the Greek or Hebrew definition in order to open up the word. But sometimes you cannot listen to the Greek or Hebrew. You have to look at the context around it. Mm -hmm. You have to consider all these things and study in order to find God's answer. Mm -hmm. Now, in John chapter 21, I want to look at um, uh, verse number 20. Now, Jesus told Peter different times, um, three times, lovest thou me? He said, feed my sheep. Verse 20, he says, Peter turned him about to see the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? Peter, seeing him, said to, to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said to him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said now to him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So here we have a teaching that's going amongst the leadership of the apostles, that this apostle is not going to die, but he's going to continue to live forever and ever. That's their doctrine, the teaching. Now, the doctrine of our brethren, which they have holding on to, is that the world, the physical world will exist continue to live forever and ever. We exist forever and ever. Mm -hmm. And so that's what one of my, my brethren told me. He's, he's gone from this world now. But he said, why would God destroy the world with fire? You know, because he's been brainwashed into believing that the metaphors of the earth being on fire is the definition of Jerusalem being on fire. That's why he's saying that. So thinking that's strange that your brethren are teaching this, the apostles we're spreading this around about John, that he's going to live forever. You know? But if we look at a few scriptures, and they, here's where they they define Matthew 24, verse 3. That's 24, verse 3, where it says uh, three questions. He says, uh, let me get here. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, tell us when shall the these things be, and what should be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? All these things. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they make a mistake because they don't read the whole context of the chapter because they look at the word world and eon. And in verse number six, it says, and he, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled for all these things must come to pass. He says, but the end is not yet. So the next war that came along was Rome which came through and, and burnt up Jerusalem, Jesus said the end is not yet. Amen. I'm not paying attention to that. Amen. Like you're going to hear of it, you're going to see it, but it's not coming yet. And so you have to look at all these things because they, the fine world is, is eon, which is the definition, 
But you have to look at where he compares Noah, just like in the days of Noah, it's going to happen in order to get the accurate uh, context of what Jesus is saying, because these three questions were answered. Mm -hmm. And um, we know that in Genesis 6, uh, verse 3, that John the, Baptist, John the Apostle did not live forever on earth. We know that the Hebrew slave in Exodus did not live forever, because Genesis chapter 6, looking at verse 3, uh, the God says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. So the days were cut. The days were cut. Adam and Eve were supposed to live forever, but their days got cut because of sin. Yes, sir. That's right. Fruit that they shouldn't have ate. Now, the world also is not going to be forever. It's going to be burnt up. But they're teaching that. Of course, that represents Jerusalem. Now, we have to pay attention to how Jesus sees things in, this, in the Bible. Psalms let me, let me, chapter. Let me say something. Jerusalem was destroyed in 139 verse 11 he says if i say surely the darkness shall cover me even the night shall be light about me yea the darkness hide it not from me but the night shineth as the day the darkness and the light are both alike he says to thee not to us Amen. i don't i can't go outside in the nighttime and look at and just you know click my eyes and see Daylight, see the earth as a daylight. It's gonna be nighttime. It's gonna be nighttime because it says to God, Amen. He could see light and dark the same way. To God, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Uh -huh. And so, we have to understand how he sees. Look at another verse in uh, the scriptures, first Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, and we know uh, this verse and what it's saying concerning Samuel. When Samuel was uh, on his way to anoint David, First Samuel chapter sixteen. We're gonna look at verse seven. Scripture says in verse seven, and it came to pass. No, I'll bring you out verse seven. He says, "But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth." For well, man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Mm. So God can see on the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God can see night as day, day as night. God can see uh, one day as a thousand years, a thousand years a day. So if you don't understand the mind of Christ and embrace how he sees things, then you're going to see things how you see things as you read the scriptures. It's going to be wrong. And it's going to be wrong. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Look at uh, amen. Look at a, a few more scriptures here. Um, look at uh, Numbers chapter twenty-two. Numbers chapter twenty-two. Numbers chapter twenty-two. Uh, looking at verse twenty-one. Numbers twenty-two. Verse twenty-one. It says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass, and went with the priests, princes of Moab. And God's anger was kindled, because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and the sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass right? to, to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, mm -hmm. a wall being on the side, this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall mm -hmm. and crushed Balaam's foot mm -hmm. 
against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down to Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled. He smote the ass with the staff and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these uh, three times? Man can't think for himself. Mm -hmm. He's got to have this book, mm -hmm. and he got to read it and read it and read it. Mm -hmm. But once a person, and I, and I didn't mean to cut you off, no, no, but no. once a person gets outside of this book mm -hmm. and start bringing in books, mm -hmm. books written by men, Same you man. are going to be in trouble, man. That's right. Amen. Amen. God bless you, brother Carl. Mm -hmm. Amen. But uh, so he opened his mouth. Mm. And she said unto him, Balaam, it was a female donkey, mm. what have I done unto thee mm. that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast written ever since I was in thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed him, bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. That angel would have killed yes. him and the donkey and everything else. Well, he wouldn't have killed the donkey because it says... No, that, well, the donkey yeah. don't mean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> they, they, they die. They don't go to no hell or hell. They just die. You know, but the angel had sword drawn, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. It says in verse 35, the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balaam. Mm -hmm. And I believe he said in this same chapter um, that he would save the ass and, yeah. and he would uh, he would kill him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, verse 33. Yeah, yeah, verse 33. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times, unless she had turned from me. Surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. So he's letting him know that I would have killed you and, and saved her. And it's the same scenario that happened. What happened when God sent the lion? The, the lion killed uh, the prophet mm -hmm. and he, the donkey was right next to him oh. and he didn't even perish. You would have to look, listening to a man, mm -hmm. a man get you killed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's, That's, it. That's it, brother. So what, what did he do? What is his error? What is Balaam's error? In verse 21, he rose up in the morning, sat his ass and went with the princes of Moab and God's anger was kindled because he went. Mm -hmm. Now, there's different scriptures in the Bible where men went to a certain area they weren't supposed to go. Mm -hmm. the prophet that got killed by the lion is one. There's other times when uh, I believe Asa went and fought against his brethren. Mm -hmm. God didn't tell him to do that. Mm -hmm. And so concerning where we go mm -hmm. and why we're going, there's things that we have to learn from the scriptures to not go in a certain direction, you know. And we have to look at the intention and we have to look at, okay, what is God's will that God's will be done? Now, if we look at uh, John chapter uh, 11, John chapter 11, let's look at another viewpoint as we begin to close. Uh, look at John 11 verse 1. Uh, the scripture says, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, mm. whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. 
And after that, said he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and go thou thither again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. Mm. These things said he, and, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. Mm. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he is he is asleep, he shall do well. How about Jesus th- spake of his death? Mm. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them, plainly, Jesus is dead. Yeah. So, looking at this definition, they've defined it as, okay, he's sleeping. But Jesus is talking about, he died. He's, he's, he's dead. That's what he's saying. And so, he told them plainly this. And what is our job? Our job is to listen to the remembrance that the Holy Spirit gives us of the scriptures and rightly divide it. Because sometimes there's metaphors, hmm. comparisons. Sometimes Jesus speaks plainly. And we cannot redefine uh, something that it is not. Because if we define it as just him sleeping, then we are misapplying this definition. Even as his disciples thought. And so there is real bread that you eat in the Bible. And then there's real, and both of them have the same Greek numbers. Mm-hmm. So what is the context of when Jesus says he's a bread and physical bread that they ate? And this is why this lesson is, is being taught. Is the context real or metaphor? Mm. Because if you begin to misapply it, mm-hmm. you begin to build. You will build and build and build on something that is false. Amen. And that will be a sear. As a conscience is seared, it will be very difficult to remove it. That's right. If it's taught for years, Mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. And then if it's taught by someone that you respect, that's why we have to respect and love God, Christ, the Holy Spirit more than man and always question. We like the Bereans. You know, how the Bereans search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So this that's that's the lesson. Um, things we have to be careful what we say and what we do, how we apply a thing, how we define a thing, because we have to give account of every outer word, and we're gonna be judged according to what we say on this earth. So that's the lesson. Um, if we can't close out with a prayer. At the